also 155, so it shouldn't be too turbulent in the air right now. Jordan, you told me that oh. one day you're going to kill me. Huh. Today's the day. We're going to get back in the air. Are you excited, with, Jordan? Like, yeah, I'm very excited. I've waited for this time for a very long time. When I go up in the air, it's um, about freedom, it's about exploration, it's about spreading your wings and soaring. Well, it all started when I uh, was young and I wanted to seek my adventure, I wanted to explore, I wanted to travel. As I remember the first glimpse of his interest um, to become a pilot is when my brother let him try on his um, flight suit for the very first time. From that day on, that was it. Plus also he watched the movie called Top Gun, as, as that's one of my favorite movies, and more and more he got really interested. I was ready for the challenge. I was ready for everything that came. The moment to be in flight school, to complete flight school, to be winged. I was there about two months, two months, yeah. I was just about to um, solo for IFS. We start tonight with breaking news. Eight people are now in the hospital after a car hit a group of pedestrians in Verdito Key. Florida Highway Patrol says that uh, one man is still in critical condition, 24-year-old Jordan Love. So essentially, we, I was hanging out with a bunch of guys who I commissioned with, and we were walking get some food in Verdito Key. And as we were getting closer to the restaurant, John Trevor comes from behind us and wipes us all down, moves us all down. I was in the back, and so I took most of the hit. On impact, I went into a coma for three days. I had my MCL, ACL torn, uh, my calf muscle torn. Um, I suffered a left side hemiparesis, um, a weakening of my left side of my body, and so suffered a very severe traumatic brain injury. There's not one single spot in his body that did not have scratches or bruises. They never thought I'd walk again, talk again. They thought I was gonna get a ventilator for the rest of my life, thought I'd be on a feeding tube for the rest of my life and never be independent again. Yes, life forever changed. And I know that for a fact that he wanted to live. Um, something tell me that that's what he wants to do. And I was calmly at that one point uh, to tell the doctor that my son's not ready to die yet. And from then on that night, my father next to my bedside uh, witnesses my arm move. And the nurse grabs the calls, the speech pathologists, the surgeons, the, the doctors, and they all come rushing in. Jordan, if you can hear me, give me a thumbs up. Nothing happened. Jordan, if you hear me, give me a second finger. <laughs> Nothing happened. And then she said, Jordan, if you can hear me, give me the bird. <laughs> and so I guess I knew what that was in a coma. I flipped them all off. Um, doctor said he responded to a uh, command. Um, we got a response. All options of pulling the plug are off the table. And from then on, you know, I lived. So this jacket was gifted to me by my command, um, and all their eight guys that were hit with me um, wanted to come up with a call sign for me. They bring me this jacket. They said, hey, this is your jacket, and it has your call sign on it. And, you know, I'm from Phoenix, Arizona, so they hand it to me, and they said, your call sign's Phoenix. And I'm like, get out. Like, have we not gone through enough? You're going to call me Phoenix because I'm from Phoenix. And they're like, no, 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 because you're gonna rise from the ashes. And it's been fitting. It's been the, the mentality of, you know, the mentality all along in recovery. You know, your, your injury incinerates you to a certain point where you are left in ashes. It gave me a spirit in which that I'm gonna fly again. I'm going to get up out of this pile of ashes, my own ashes, and I'm going to make a life that I want to live, a life that I want for myself. Okay, go ahead and lift up that left foot. Pull up, pull up, pull, 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 pull. Thus, I was in a wheelchair and bedridden 
for about 16 weeks and not walking. Today is August the 6th, 2017, and Jordan is walking by himself. It's been a little bit over three months from the accident. Jordan is working every single day to get where he's at right now. I cannot explain how you never give up. As my nephew, as a fellow service member, I, you know, I mean, you know, you are what this country is about. Yes, yeah, I was told I'd never walk again. But uh, that was the time I, I, you know, checked something off my list, uh, a big one, too. Marty Party, that's what he's called. Oh God, yeah, Marty Party was my nickname. With long hair. No, 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 skinny no, 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 we're not talking about my asshole days. <laughs> not talking about my long hair or skinny jeans. Suddenly, Obviously, when it happened, I was completely devastated. Like, I've never been so devastated in my entire life, but I, I knew deep down somewhere within me that this is just a hump in the road for him. This is, it kind of pretty much, it sucks, but, you know, he's going to obviously get better from it. It's the way I looked at it. Like, it's almost like it didn't happen. I mean, it's... You know, he's walking like it's never happened. It's, I mean, he's I, he's recovering at a substantial rate. Yeah. Always. Brother. <laughs> Love you, dude. Love you. <laughs> Even though you go to U of A. They said I'd never walk in. They said I'd never talk again. They said I'd be on a ventilator feeding too for the rest of my life. They thought I was going to be a vegetable. And clearly not. I believe it's fueled by my desire to serve and my desire to get to return to a life in which I had worked so diligently hard and hard for. This is, you know, why I joined the Navy, to be around this kind of culture and see those planes take off, to see those guys and girls in the cockpit. That's where I want to be. I went into a coma wanting to be an able aviator. I woke up wanting to be an able aviator. Nothing has changed. Not for a second have I ever like, thought about another goal or mission. It all makes sense to you in recovery. You know, sure, why did this happen to you, but also why you have your passions and your desires that you want in life throughout your life. You know, being in the Navy only for two years, um, but being so passionate about it to serve and to wear the uniform proudly, it almost becomes a part of you. It almost becomes embedded into your DNA. It was like this. Yeah. <laughs> what would Tom Maverick say? For a long time, um, there was a lot of uncertainties and, and guesses um, of if I would ever be in the air again. And as that be as I progressed in recovery, that that answer became a little bit more clear to me. First opportunity I had to go back in the air, I took it. a sense of freedom. Um, I left all my worries and concerns on the ground. I went up there and spread my wings. Um, it was, it reminded me a lot of my, my time in Pensacola flying out there. And um, it's, a, it's a position in a, in a situation I wish and I work so diligently for to regain. Everything is geared towards getting back to Pensacola, returning to flight training, and revitalizing a dream and a mission that I had before and I have now. Cheers, buddy. Happy birthday, man. I love you. Yeah. Happy birthday. I believe I have um, a greater sense of mental fortitude now than I, I did when I was there, um, and to cherish every moment and to live life to the fullest. It's a cliche saying, and I've heard it a thousand times, but I never really knew the worth in that saying. Because you don't want to get kicked off the mountain before you really realize that statement is true.
Yeah, one here. Every single time I see that documentary, it's like a, a mile marker. <laughs> like, oh, it's three years, four years. It's like, wow. Um, so good morning, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Lieutenant Lowe, and today I have the privilege to share with you all of yeah, it's like my journey to a fit binding. Um, those three letters, although very, you know, in a lot of words, um, English, though that they are three letters, its meaning symbolizes something far greater than ourselves. That is, sir. Okay, so to understand my my, my journey, uh, it's important to know Uh, a lifelong dream, and that is um, It was one of my, the happiest days of my life, commissioning, raising my right hand, and then being a part of the heritage and the tradition from then on. Um, afterwards, you know, I started heading down to Pensacola, otherwise known as the Cradle of Naval Aviation. Um, and, you know, as a history buff, um, I was thrilled to, to follow the same footsteps as some of history most courageous. You got John McCain, you have Neil Armstrong, John Glenn, and the list goes on. Jim Lovell, and uh, I, I was ready to start my career, upset. ready to really be a part of it all. And I did my IFS training in Foley, Alabama with Lightning Aviation. Wait, have a little bit of sound on the Zoom. Can you move the mic up and see if that helps? Yeah. Yeah. We can give you the hand. It's better. Can you guys hear better? Say something. Testing. <laughs> Testing one. Can you hear now, they say. Good. All right. Okay. Great. So, yes, I was saying I was at Lightning Aviation, and, you know, I'm, that's where the Navy sends you to learn how to be a pilot. Uh, you're there with a civilian form base of operations, and you go through ground training, you go through the basics of it all before you go back to solo there, before you go back to the schoolhouse and learn how to become a new aviator by um, starting to learn how to fly the T6 Texan II uh, before going off the primary. Um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, Lieutenant, we're working through this. It's not wanting to progress on the shared. might be dying. Mm -hmm. I have made it. No, it's not. <laughs> Why is this not working? So for the next thing while we wait, uh, find to the person to your right and just give them the biggest uh, safety stare. <laughs> okay. All right, we're good. I'm, I'm doing good. I think so. I don't know how I did that, but yes. Okay. Right, so um, what I was saying, I was in Foley, Alabama, Lightning Aviation, and I'm sitting in my Piper Cherokee, <clears throat> the Piper Cherokee with my CFL right next to me. I'm thinking to myself, 
is the Navy really going to pay me to fly? And sure enough, they do. <laughs> um, I remember sitting in my pipe, the Piper Cherokee, rumbling at the end of the runway. And upon getting clearance to, to take off, I remember the feeling of pushing, the, you know, opening the throttle and pulling up on the wheel. And it was incredible. It was, you know, I felt my wings open for the very first time. And from then on, I, my eyes are drawn upward. So, several weeks later, this happened. <laughs> um, you know, it's uh, life came out of the blue. Life happens. Um, I was I just completed my verbal check ride before solo, scheduling the solo the next day. So, um, you know, as as a as you know. As the picture well describes, you know, it, it was a lot to go through, um, but you know, it just—it's uh, been a process for sure. Um, you know, when I would I like to say, you know, when you're millennial, when the first thing you wake up from a coma is you ask where your phone's at. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, uh, now I would ask my my mom, my dad, my sister, and friends who are my oasis. I recognized them after coming out of a coma. You know, where's my phone? Hey, mom, do you have my phone? <laughs> but oh, your dad has it. Dad, do you have my phone? Oh, your sister has it. Sister, so on and so forth. But, you know, little did I know that they were trying to keep my phone away from me. <clears throat> my uncle had had uh, posted a viral post explaining the, the incident that occurred that night, and. Um, I realized once I got my phone back, what they were sheltering me from. And so um, when I got my phone back the very first time, turned it on, floods of messages, text messages, voicemails, notifications came flooding through. And I realized when I opened up Facebook that the that I stared in that I started staring into the bloodshot eyes of a man with a long beard, with a beard and long shaggy hair, sitting next to my photo of my, the happiest day of my life when I was my commission made off the school. Um, you know, it was, I realized at the time what happened. Um, I felt like I was sitting in a mass, in, a, in the middle of a mad sea. You know, but I hung on to two questions that has guided me since. One, am I still in the Navy? <coughs> and two, am I still a flight train? Out of everything I could have thought about, those were the two things that I held on to. And those two questions, like I was like I just mentioned, have guided me to be, you know, to to rehabilitate, to be found fit, uh, to stay in the Navy, and still want to make this a career. Um, and you know, it's just, uh, and also to the picture on the right, those of those seven sailors, shipmates of mine, were also hurt with us, hurt with me, or I mean, we were all all of us were walking tonight. Um, it's been a journey. So rehab begins. So I was frail. I was in the frailest state of my life. I was so frail that my right, my entire left side of my body was so weak I couldn't even use my hands or feet. My, as the picture on the left shows, my trunk was so weak I couldn't even sit up in a bed without any support. And actually, that was a milestone right there, where the the, doc, the nurse is, you know, like, I'm not holding him, I'm not touching him. He's sitting up by himself. Um, I've had to regain everything. Um, from time, you know, learning how to put pants on, from learning how to just walk, proper implement gait, proper gait patterns, um, to run, and whatnot, um, regain the use of your legs and your, your hands. I was told from the get-go that um, doctors were saying, you know, it's, it's impossible to regain everything back. Um, but I've I've been fortunate to be able to do so. Um, I remember nurses and doctors would, would, would tell me when I'm making the rounds, it's okay if you don't want to be in the Navy, if you don't want to stay in the Navy, if you don't want to be in flight training still. And I thought to myself, why wouldn't I want to? It has given me the hope that everything will be okay. Um, it has given me something to fight for. And really, hope is everything. Because once you have hope, you know exactly what you're fighting for. You know in what direction you're heading towards, what course you're going to be taking. And um, 
So my journey, my rehabilitation journey started when I broke free from a coma. But it, the, the, uh, when I started to rehabilitate, to fight for myself, was when I left Pensacola. Um, and then picture in the middle, taking on June 15th, um, there's a beloved Sadie. Um, she's a golden retriever that will go out and greet other planes coming in, taking off out of a, out of a in this jetway in Pensacola, Florida. She's a, she's a local icon. Um, she and I had the privilege of her, you know, waiting in the office I departed. And the Navy had arranged for an Air Force medevac, um, picture on the right. Um, and coincidentally, their, their crew was flew under the, the banner of Phoenix. So I saw in the patches on the, on the shoulders, which was pretty cool. Um, and next slide, please. so then I went to, then I landed in Moffa Airfield in Palo Alto, California. This is where I first heard about the physical evaluation board, medical evaluation board process. Um, it is here where, you know, I, I did most of my inpatient, if not all of my, well, most of my inpatient, the transitional phase uh, before I went off to be an outpatient. Um, so, <laughs> so every patient goes through two phases of recovery while at the VA Palo Alto. So the first one, you're in, inpatient, inpatient. You're in the 7D ward room where you're in close proximity to all the nurses, the doctors, they keep an eye on you. Um, to regain your ADLs, your activities of daily living, before you can go on to the uh, transitional program P trip, uh, which then brings you back into you know the then brings you back in society, but also kind of keeps you back in your feet. They focus on more independence. And so, as you can imagine, there've been really there's been lots of tough times, many tough moments, um, and just me being able to well just just uh, Many, many tough moments, um, as you can see in the pictures, I'm all, you know, I'm trying to, I mean, I'm PT in some form of fashion. Um, you know, my, my first milestone that I set for myself was to walk. And I remember at night when, after the nurses would come in, take my vitals, turn off the lights, I'd actually get out of bed. And I would actually walk alongside my bed rail, um, try to try to get that the feeling in my legs again. And, you know, I mean, you had to go from, you know, you had to progress up uh, with Randy in the second picture here, you know, with manual control facilitation, help me restore that heat pattern to using the exoskeleton, which it's, it's an, you almost feel like a cyborg. It's, it's like it moves for you. You kind of just go like, all right, I'm going for the ride kind of deal. And the last photo, which is um, the day they put me on a treadmill. So I very remember, remember I remember vividly day I started walking. So I tried to, you know, I tried to incorporate similar, you know, workout routines as I did prior to. I would go to the gym every single day. The gym was really the PT clinic. Um, and they had put me on the treadmill on Friday. Um, and of course, I go back on Saturday and I, I walk in and I wheel myself in a wheelchair there. I said, hey, um, can I help on the treadmill? And PT is like, yeah, and your well was treated. Yeah, no way. Um, so you haven't been cleared yet. So I got on the arm bike, just sort of pedaling, just standing up. And I thought to myself, my feet built in my room, and my mom's in my room. My mom's always kind of like, Man, you're getting in trouble here, like all the time. Um, but I wheeled myself back into my room. I parked my, my wheelchair at the very end of my bed. And I dramatically got up. I said, Mom, you know, can you put the, the gate bell on me? She's like, What for? She's like, I'm like, you'll see. She's like, Oh man, what kind of trouble are you gonna get me into now? And so just as I do at night, I hovered my right hand over the rail, walked the end of the, the bed. But there's a, a five foot clearance from the edge of the bed to the sink. And I'm running out of rail, like running out of rail. And I was like, okay, there's a moment of truth. Either I fall on my face right now, or I start walking. 
and that's when I took my first steps. And I remember <laughs> so my, my, my uncle Don, Anthony's and three little girls came to visit that weekend. And my mom had to go to run a Costco. She's like, don't, whatever, don't do this without me, not without me being here. Um, I was like, okay, what do I do? I grab my phone, I'm FaceTiming everyone. I'm like, look what I'm doing. Like I'm just walking <laughs> back and forth, I'm back and forth in the, uh, of my room. It was the happiest moment of life. I said, if any, if anything, if, if I could just, if, if everything could be that easy. Um, but that was, you know, that was, you almost become addicted to the taste of success after experiencing like that. Um, and after you, you've accomplished ADLs, then you move on to the transitional rehabilitation chapter, p -trip. So p -trip, Holy Trauma Transitional Rehabilitation Program. This is where I actually started first hearing about the network process. Um, you know, many people, if you were at the Palo Alto Healthcare Center, you were there for a traumatic event, your career was seriously in question. Um, and I remember service members left the right of me in the war room were being medically discharged um, at a pretty substantial rate. And I realized that though my, that though my dreams, my passions to return to aviation to a pilot were still beating in my heart, that I would have to first overcome the bed board process and the PV process. And so I realized very quickly that those who held the power, held the, the uh, held those who were the control of my fate in the Navy weren't local doctors. I never met them, and they only judged. They determined my my uh, consideration for board based off of medical evidence. So I knew that the nurses document everything from what I wore when I came out of my wardrobe, from what I did after I came out of the wardrobe, what time I came out you know, from my wardrobe, whatnot. So I don't know if this worked, but I would actually, so I, I thought to myself, how do I prove these doctors who I've never met, never talked to, that I can stay fit in the, uh, that I can be fit in the Navy and still serve in the Navy? And so what I did was I come out about five o'clock, six o'clock in the morning, I asked the nurses to hold my feet down and I crank out about 100 sit ups to try to match the Navy PRT. Um, you know, I would wear my uniform every single, this uniform every single day, knowing that I could wear the uniform. I, I, could, I would go to the gym all the time, just right across the hallway of my, my wardrobe and, and just work out, work out, work out. Again, I don't know if that actually works, but um, I, I was willing to do anything and everything it took to, to stay in the Navy. And so, um, once, like I said, once you're done, when, once you graduate from P-Trip, you move on to the outpatient phase of, of your recovery. So then I, you know, I go to Balboa, uh, Naval Medical Center in San Diego. And so, at the, while the VA, no one really, I mean, that wasn't going. It was hard to get clear answers of how the med board and physical evaluation board process is going to be like. Um, but here, I was no longer at the VA, I was no longer at a, clinic outside of the Navy. I was in the Navy. Like, I was in the backyard of the Navy. This is where it all happens. And so, you know, um, this is where I, all of my EB process took place. And so, C5, Comprehensive Combat Casualty Care Center. C5 is the, the epicenter of all the, where all the uh, rehabilitation, rehabilitation takes place. You've got your OTs, your PTs, your vestibular therapists, um, all the Ts, they're all there. Um, and, um, you know, I was there every day. Um, my mom, um, you know, ever since she put, ever since she got that phone call from my captain, she put, she dropped everything for two years of her life just attending me. And um, she was also living with me in the barracks at the time of going 26. I was not able to drive and um, she was there, you know, to be a kid, as my caregiver and to be my, my rock, my foundation. Um, 
And, you know, you know, when sun's up, it's, that's when the game face is on. My, my job is to rehabilitate is my goal. I mean, it, I mean, you're expected to be on active duty to, to, as your primary goal when sun's up to rehabilitate, get better and get back to the, or get to the fleet. And so rehabilitation didn't, wasn't just a routine, added routine to my current lifestyle, my current routine or regimen at the time, it became a lifestyle. So I, you know, I wasn't rehabilitating in the clinic, I was rehabilitating in my, in my, my barracks room and like wherever. Um, and, And so things that was that was when I first got to San Diego, but things really started taking off after my cranial plastic surgery. As you can see in the pictures, I wasn't wearing I'm not wearing I wasn't wearing a helmet in the pictures anymore. Um, that's when things really started to take off. It was just a, a psychological improvement, not wearing, not being underneath a turtle shell, not feeling like you're going to go to war all the time. But you could hang up the helmet. You could feel like yourself again. You could feel like you blend in with the population, and it served me well. Um, and so, you know, I would go to C five physical therapy clinic every single day. Work with Mike there in the second, in the second photo. I would work with everybody there. Um, but we have, I picture, I caught this picture um, of us boxing, and uh, you know, they're really supportive of your of your goals and. You know, this, I was able to start becoming more, I mean, involved with dynamic activity and the lactic acid in my legs was, you know, although most people try to avoid it, I, I was running towards it because it felt so familiar to me. And, but it felt, felt familiar before at the same time. And I always mentioned that analogous of what I, analogy of what I went, what my, most of my journey has encompassed is having to regain all the use of my left side of my body is like as if uh, a grown man was trapped in a baby's body because you have all these memories and all these this knowledge of what you could do and you, you were able to use to do it, but your body's not letting you do it. So you kind of feel jailed in your, in your, in yourself, but you know, and I mean, although it's, it's a struggle, but there are a lot of rewards come out too. A lot of good feeling, like I had accomplished this. The short-term goals build long-term leaps and bounds, and before you know it, then you've come so far. And so, on the picture on the right, you know, we we worked together as a team to have me be able to meet certain Navy standards, like such as the PRT. And so, in November of 2019, I well, November 2018. 18, I took my first PRT since this this, uh, this journey had started, um, and this really it's just it's just uh, it's a team effort, um, and I'm great, very grateful and thankful for everyone who's been you know part of the process. Um, wouldn't have been wouldn't be standing up here if it wasn't for everybody. And so now here's the, the meat and potatoes, the physical evaluation board. I gone through two limbs, two six periods a year. Um, now it was my time to go for a board, and I'd be lying if I didn't say I was terrified. Because when I was back at the VA, right? I mean, everyone was getting med board left and right. It was a burp, med board. It was very common, um, and I had tried to do everything, you know, to like, okay, like I don't even want to put my career in the realm of, of possibilities of being med board out of the Navy. But, you know, I had to go for board. And relating to Dr. Wilson's um, content of mapping safety, once I was in the process, which, you know, once the process starts, you're at the mercy of the process, right? Um, but you you guys, you know, attorneys, the med Peblos, Medlos, everybody part of the team made me feel, assured me that my time, I wasn't supposed to go up for a mid board before, and I'm not supposed to go up for one later, but at that moment, now is the time to go up for a mid board. And 
you know, when I got a hold of the first narrative summary, I was jaw dropped, in disbelief. I couldn't believe what they were saying about me, what I couldn't do. Um, I took that, that narrative summary, I walked over my PT, I said, they're saying this, they're saying that, let's demonstrate that I can do this. And so the picture, they said I couldn't climb a ladder. Then there was, hey, there's a, uh, there's not a wall right outside. We can climb, you know, climb that's about 40, 50 feet high. Um, then, you know, it was just, I wanted to stand so badly. Um, I tried and I didn't want just medical, medical notation to dictate my faith. So what I did was I, I went out to my, my leadership, you know, leadership or whoever can vouch for my, my willingness to stay in the Navy and, and continue to serve. And I reached out for letters of recommendations because I believe that letters of recommendations provide that perspective that medical notation can't, the black and white of medical notes can't. And so I remember when I went to go, I walked my, my package over to for submission to Mark Genovich. She's like, oh my gosh, you got a lot of letter recommendations. I told them that's how badly I want to stay in. And so, yes, my um, gotta give a shout out to my 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 uh, EB team, Adrian Rose, my attorney, Mark Genovich, my Kevlo, and Didi Gordon as well. And um, I realize how small this community is, and you guys probably all know who they are, um, but they've been tremendous. They've been tremendous uh, throughout the process, and I want to you know, throw out the shout outs because I'm truly grateful that they were that I was able to work with them. Oh, yeah. That's the animation. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so, yes, yeah, so we went through the process. I remember those days when I called Adrian. Hey, did you get an update? Hey, did you get an update? Nothing yet? Okay. You know, I was sitting there nervous, pulling my thumbs, you know, kind of like, okay, like, this feels, time feels way slower. Um, but I remember the call I got on May 21st, 2019, when the results came in. And I was, I mean, I was, I felt like I was on top of now, like I was on top of the world. And, you know, Adrian said, you know, you can come fit. And even let, and even better yet, they even let you keep your designator a student able aviator. And I thought, wow, like, that's wild. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and he said, you know, someone was calling you to, for you to go and sign papers. But, you know, I got on the phone and went afterwards to my mom, you know, that, you know, what, what I just, what I just learned. And I think we should in the middle of the grocery store. She's like, oh my gosh, she like just dropped everything. And like, you know, but it goes to show that we are one, we've been one team all along. And, you know, I, and you mentioned this, but I'm truly grateful for everybody's, you know, cooperation. I mean, just investment in me in the process. And so right when I got that call for that was expected to be called to look out for, I didn't I didn't think to put on my tactics, I just got in the car and left. I was like, I better sign this now before they take back the offer. <laughs> 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 but yes, I was uh, that I, that was also one of my other happiest days of my life. And so I, I was found fit. Then I went to the medical readiness uh, office and was found fully fit when the readiness doctor recommended for worldwide signability. So now I'm fully fit for duty. I've got to do something. <laughs> I've got to, I got to perform my, my duties as the, the duties of the designator that hold the cold. And so, you know, air pack was across the bay and over in Coronado, Manor Naval Air Forces, and well, Pacific Fleet, and right next to it, Manor Naval Air Forces. And I had an opportunity to work with them, and it wasn't work. It was, I love being there. I mean, I remember my first assignment, like my uh, J Rod, my commander, asked me, Have you seen Office Space? I'm like, No. Have you seen Super Troopers? Like, no. Like, that's your homework. And so I'm like, wow, it's like if aviation, if this is the hope to have a homework again, you know, like, no, but um, I went home that night and I remember I was like, if this is my first assignment that I've gotten in aviation, 
I'm gonna go home. I'm gonna buy them on I'll buy those movies on iTunes. I'm gonna watch them tonight. Um, it was truly a an, it was a remarkable experience being there. I mean, I've never been in the fleet. Didn't finish flight training, but I get to learn all this higher echelon, higher 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 hierarchy, uh, strategic readiness operations, and it was it was a great time. And as my right before I departed, so actually sorry. So when I was there, um, you know, I was still recovering. My nanny and attrition letter came in, saying that you know we're not recommending for waivers. And so they tried to meet my designator. So then I had to go up for the Parker board, the probationary officer redesignation board. Um, and Parker board is usually, you know, it's, it's there for as, as probationary entails. If you're not following the cookie cutter concept. Your career is, is, is unique. It's, it's not re reassuring um, as others. And so it kind of calls for you to move into another lateral trans, like lateral call for you to transfer into another designator or community. Um, so I, I, I uh, went through a pocket board, um, went to two actually, and I was found, I was picked up by the IP community, the information professional community, part of the IWC, the information warfare community. Um, that's what I currently am now. I'm an 1820. And it, even that process was you know, an animal itself. It's scary uh, because, you know, you put in the, the dream sheet, your five choices for redesignation, and, you know, all, and then the officer community manager meets. And, you know, if the first one, you know, based off of the first one on the dream sheet, the dream list, are we going to take it or are we not going to take it? And then it goes down to the second, the third, the fourth, and the fifth. Um, but, you know, I, I'm grateful to be in that community now. Um, and as the pictures show, this was taken as my parting gift from AirPac. Uh, my commander had arranged for his old squadron to get me up in a Seahawk. And I was like, man, this is, this is crazy. This is, a, this, is a, this, this is a dream. And if that's something I could experience then, I know what it feels like. And as I mentioned before, then you, have, you, you, gotta, when you fuse that with hope, then you have everything you need going forward. I live by like, a, uh, so when I was, when I grew up, my mom, so my parents taught me two things, two things live by. My mom, my dad always taught me that everything will be okay. And what he mean by that was, no matter the circumstance, no matter what's going on, you'll always find a peace somehow. My mom taught me that work, you know, hard work pays off. I combined the two, to now to have been hold, held on, have been holding on to, as long as I work hard, everything will be all right. And that's what continues to push me forward and forward. Um, because then I was, you know, even my most, my most comfortable moments were actually when I'm working, when I am, when I am uh, rehabbing, because I know I'm getting better. And it's just, uh, yeah. It's, that's so it's been a journey. Um, Lieutenant Lowe, I just want to thank you so much yeah. for speaking to us. And actually, I want to give the opportunity um, for our audience here and online, if there's any comments or questions, or Lieutenant, um, if you have any, I'm, I'm going to move this back over here okay. just for the camera for our folks. Um, being able to hear, oh, we have to have, all right, so hang on. Uh, you stand there, we're going to move over here with this one. All right. Sorry, I didn't. Mean no, no, no. Lieutenant, I'm just uh, curious. Did you go through um, with the medical board? Did you go through the LDES process or the IDES process involving the VA? I went through the IDES process. And when you did your VA claim, um, did you claim everything, or did you hold back to to reduce the expanse of what I imagine 
um, would have been an incredibly long list of medical conditions that you could have claimed. That maybe you couldn't find, by the way. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, um, I was going to say, I mean, I wasn't hiding anything. I mean, it was all out there. Um, prior to the injury, my file was non existent. I, don't, I didn't remember ever going to the doctor for anything. Um, but then, you know, after what it transpired, you know, textbooks, multiple textbooks, things, I'm assuming. Um, but I just, you know, I had just gone there and I, you know, couldn't hide it. I mean, it was, here, here, is, here is where I am now. And um, just hope for the best. Thank you. And, and thank you for all the hard work um, and your willingness to share the details of what you went through with us. Really appreciate it. Oh, be careful. Thank you, Lieutenant Lowe. Right, my question is, uh, did you go through, um, how were you found fit for duty? Were you found informally fit for duty by the PEB without a hearing? Or did you have to testify uh, through the board process? So actually, I'm glad that you brought that up because um, it's, that's a very important in my board process. So I was found fit by the informal board. And I remember when I submitted, everyone was like, hey, let's pray for the best. You know, if, if this doesn't work out, then you can go up on the home board. And yeah, I was, yeah, I was, I was very happy to come hit by the home board, but yes. <laughs> Over here. Uh, sir, Sergeant Kirksey. So uh, one, I just want to say no questions, uh, but thank you for your story. Uh, thank you for uh, bringing that to the table because it is important. Uh, and as a member of the uh, IDES FIT team, uh, again, I just want to say thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would, I would uh, thank you uh, for sharing your story with us. Very much appreciate it. I have a potentially complex uh, question for you, so if you don't want to answer it now, I would appreciate this uh, email. Um, I, I want to gain access to my clients at an earlier point than I currently do. Uh, particularly to help them figure out if they want to be found fit or unfit. Because by the time they get to me, they've usually made a decision to be found unfit. Is there a point where you would recommend that uh, we can insert ourselves in a better spot that, than we currently do to kind of keep that hope going? Because a lot of times I can talk to a client and the hope's not there anymore. Right. I mean, I would, I mean, I think most people have their minds made up before they get to the process, because um, even with a lot of the service members, they already know that the, the medical board is inevitable. Um, they, they, you know, they have, they, either they want to become fit or unfit. Everyone's got their own circumstance. Um, but I think just as I have received, I mean, not, the, safety, the, the safety map I received when, I, when uh, my team reached out to me, I think that's really the best time. Be transparent. Hey, do you want to be found fit or unfit? Um, because everyone's got their own circumstance, and you can't guilt someone for, for choosing one or the other. Um, but I remember when I had first heard of the medical board process, and I was frantic at it. I thought it was like I was doing everything I could to not get to it. But then once I was in it, I was way more calm and relaxed than I initially saw from the outside. And so, and that was like I was mentioning, because I had all the information, I know it's in the process now, and up front, I said, I want to become fit. Um, and, you know, you, you, uh, you basically, I think, just presenting yourself when the board is initiated, you guys wouldn't be able to track, you guys, are you guys assigned to somebody before, like how early in advance? Right, and this is, a, this is a, yeah, there's a lot of aspects to this question, right? Thank you for asking it. I know it's not necessarily fair to put it all on you on how we do it, but, you know, I think for, you know, the attorneys, paralegals here, that that's something we should talk about is how, how can we start talking to service members early, and it, it may be different uh, branch by branch on how that works and exactly how the process works, but I think it is a great question, um, and let's let's amongst ourselves and, and some of our oncoming discussions uh, get more into that but um 
I, I'm going to give you, you know, I think any any last words, and then we'll, we'll close out. We just really appreciate your, you know, your service member perspective of going through this process. Um, any last nuggets that you would like, you know, the attorneys, paralegals, to remember as as they represent individuals like you through this. Yes, ma'am. So, thank you for all you guys do. Um, what you do does does move mountains. Um, I discovered today, actually. Mr. Chittister was with my parents at the time during those three days of me being in coma. And, you know, I, you know, I was like, it was a surreal moment, right? I was like, I got on the phone, I was like, look who I just met. And they all remember Mr. Chittister. They knew exactly the recommend. They remember the recommendation that he gave. And it goes to show your, the impact that you, get, you guys get and give to, fam to families. Um, and so thank you for all that you do because if it wasn't for you guys, and like I mentioned, like I had a great team, and if it wasn't for them, and you know, the system that's, that's been set up, I wouldn't be staying in front of, and standing up here in front of you guys today. Um, so can't thank you enough. Like, <laughs> uh, very grateful um, for you guys, and um, and thanks so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, thank you again to Lieutenant Lowe. Um, we will be on a break until 25 after. If you could please be back in your seats at 25 after, um, then we will have the Judge Advocate General of the Navy speaking at 30 after. So as you see there, I'm getting you back in your seats early. Uh, so please be back at 25 after early. All right, thank you.